I met Sean when he was on our board some years ago, and he doesn't remember meeting me, so I made a really good impression, but we later met at the um, Special Education Advisory Council. We're both members of that right now, and Sean's a professor at KU and also a parent, and he has done a lot of great things with us and for us. He invites us often to speak with students in his classroom and comes and speaks at our conferences, and I know that you guys will all you know, be delighted and learn a lot from him. So, Sean, great person and friend. Well, thank you, Leslie. Good morning, everybody. I feel like I'm in Sherwood Forest here with the trees here. Uh, I also feel like I'm the Friday before spring break uh, presentation, the Friday. So I know some of you probably have done those types of presentations. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Leslie mentioned, a uh, faculty member of the University of Kansas, but I'm also a parent of four little, well, they're getting older. I have a, uh, one that's going to be a seventh grader next year, 12-year-old. I have a 10-year-old, and that's a little guy with Down syndrome. And I'll contextualize things uh, throughout the morning, this session and the latter session with Nolan. Uh, I'm all about context, and uh, so I'll ground it with there. I also have a uh, upcoming fourth grader, and also, uh, which we just found out to have ADHD, and that's a whole nother world. Uh, and then also a uh, about to be first grader. So you're going to hear this today. So I'm, I'm going to start things off with this keynote, but then I have an extended version. And so the things I'm going to try to talk about today are with multiple hats. The hats of a faculty member who's engaged in a lot of research on this area, but also engaged with future teachers, but also current teachers. So you're gonna hear very much a pre-K through 12 type of focus. Uh, but I'm also, uh, excuse me, through 21. Also though engaged with a variety of folks interacting with adults. So what I'll hear, even though I may contextualize classroom and you're saying, well gosh, Sean, what about those adults? Bring it there because I feel, actually that's even more complicated in the world of technology, as many of you know. But I'll wear that hat. The other hat is, is a family member, as I mentioned, uh, as, as a parent, um, but also the hat uh, as a teacher, because I'm out working a lot of teachers and a, a strong believer in the power of the educator and what they can do for our children. So with that, let's kind of get started. What you have in front of you, including breakfast, which looks wonderful. Uh, I just can't eat before presentation, so I'm missing out on that wonderful breakfast. But you have a, a two-pager. And the two-pager right now isn't going to be particularly helpful as I go along what I'm going to share today uh, in terms of, gosh, am I following along with the first site, et cetera? No, I'm not. At the bottom of the pager, though, both top of, of uh, front and back, you'll see I have plenty of them. So let me get unset. Okay, I have a... That's all right. I've got a bunch in here, so there you go. All right. So at the bottom, though, you have my email address, but more importantly, you have a wiki address. And for those folks that use wikis, they're wonderful. They're a top 10 Web 2.0 technologies for educators. Uh, what you'll say, have there is a direct access to this PowerPoint. Uh, I've broken up into components, as well as a Word document, which is about nine pages of a variety of resources. And you may be saying, Sean, a Word document, why aren't you using a delicious account or something like that? Well, I find folks like yourself really like to have that Word document. Then you can manipulate, reorganize, and get it out in a variety of different ways. So that's sitting there on the wiki. So at your leisure, feel free to go up there and grab that information. So with that, Feel free to ask questions as we go along. We have a short period of time. If you want the extended version, come back at 9.15? Yep. Yes, okay, come back at 9.15. All right, so with that, let's kind of get started. And I know you've, t you've talked a lot about technologies uh, over the last couple days. I'm going to go a little old school. I'm going to go a little new school and also in terms of what's currently happening as well. So let's start off with the ideas of what's available out there for our students. I'm going to offer the fact that there's some challenges in this integration. I could, you know, bother you the entire day about my son, but I'm not. But there's some challenges. I'm living them, and a lot of folks out there are living them. And I know, folks, I'm a strong believer, and honestly, um, to me, it's, 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 a, it's a delight to be working with you folks because I believe, in all honesty, where we are with technology integration, 
it's the parents that are going to be the critical element. We are having some challenges in terms of our schools, in terms of good technology integration for students with disabilities in a very meaningful way. And I could show you lots of different studies on that. I'll refer to some of that. I'll refer to the research not being done on that. But I think the parent is a critical element here that is not uh, to me is not equally at the table. So, so with that, I want to offer you some also possible uh, aspects of solutions in terms of uh, going there. All right. So when I talk to people about technology, and I know you guys are much beyond this, but folks in terms of the integration of assistive technology, I talk to technologists, I talk to folks out there doing the assistive technologies, I hear a lot about augmented communication. I'm talking to an AT coordinator who's a former speech and language pathologist and she says we're doing a wonderful job. I'm a speech, uh, I'm a AT halftime coordinator uh, in a large school district outside the Kansas City area that has wonderful things going on but the fact of the matter is for AT there's about three part-time AT people and they're all speech and language pathologists. So when you talk AT to them they talk to you about augmented communication and they talk to you about symbolate and they talk to you about board maker and honestly folks I'm sorry Mary Johnson but I don't like you right now. No. Um, <laughs> board maker the problem with me with board maker is it's CD specific still if for those of you that have used board maker and the fact of the matter is then I need to find out where that speech pathologist is to get a hold of that board maker in many of the districts and I won't ramble on at that one but where I'm going with this is the fact that I think in some areas we do technology extremely well for students with disabilities but I'd offer it's a little more traditional and it's probably very focused on a small percentage of our population out there in terms of let's say hundred percent of children with disabilities I'd argue less than ten percent is where we're doing a very good job or a good job with assistive technology and a lot of that is access a lot of that's functional a lot of that is with our, uh, maybe it's the fact I can't see it, I can't hear it, I need mobility access. Very important things, very critical things, but what about what about the students with Down syndrome, intellectual disabilities? What about the students with learning disabilities? What about the students on the spectrum that are high functioning, but the fact of the matter is they can read, but they can't comprehend it worth a hoot? Or my social anxiety issues or, or the like. Those individuals are what I want to spend some time talking about with you today. All right, so with that in mind, let's kind of talk about some of the technologies out there. So let me ask you this, folks. How many of us are using, uh, in terms of Bookshare, with our uh, digital text? Yeah? Bookshare, sure. Bookshare is wonderful. Bookshare has been out there for years uh, since IDA. This is one of the IDA 2004 outcomes, right? So now I have digital text. Uh, folks, what are you using for digital text in terms of how they're accessing it? What programs are they using to be able to listen to the digital text or see the digital text? Can you remember anything? What's that? I can't remember what it is. I called our center okay. that does the assistive technology. Okay. They gave me a free download. Oh, good, okay. That was wonderful. You know, folks, Bookshare is wonderful. For those that are unfamiliar with it, I can get my textbooks. It's not perfect. I can get my textbooks. I can get my books. I can get potential poems and others in a digital format. For then, I can put them through a reader. And the reader could be Read Write Gold, it could be Read Please, it could be Natural Reader, it could be a variety of different things. All right, that's out there, that's free. This is old school. Now, let me reinforce that for you folks in terms of what I mean by old school here. But I want to reinforce this and natural reader. This is free. This is both PC and Mac. So welcome to natural reader software. Natural Reader is a professional text-to-speech program that converts any written text into spoken words. In other words, it allows you Right, so that's out there. And then also I can grab a mini board. I'll show this later on. But the mini board is any text I have, I can grab and put it in there as well. This is old. Research shows that if I see the text and hear the text, my fluency and comprehension will be improved, specifically if I have a learning disability. Research is also shown if I simply hear the text. I mean, some of you driving out here or flying out here know what I'm talking about when just hearing the text. How many of you have been in the middle of an audio book you know, I, I just drove from, well, I won't explain the craziness of getting here, but anyways, uh, I was in the car not too long ago, driving along, worrying about traffic, worrying about construction. A half hour later, I'm like, now, what was I just listening to? Yeah, so we go back, the audio book with all the other distractors, and we're talking, we're t somewhat typical. So audio books, I hear too often, oh, well, for those individuals who are print impaired, we give them audio books. 
No, no, the research is too clear to show audiobooks are helpful, but they're certainly not nearly as effective as getting the digital text I can see and hear at the same time. Now I can chunk it and do lots of different things. This has been out there for a while. My question to you is when you're working with folks that are working in the schools, what are they using? And what I find is that a lot of them have access to free things like this, but they aren't using this. Or they'll say Bookshare, well Bookshare is only for those individuals who are print impaired. And we've defined that to be people who are visually impaired. Which basically, if you go to the state of Kansas, the person that runs Bookshare that coordinates that is out of the school for the deaf. Which is fine, but the challenge is that's a small percentage of the population, and if you t interpret it very narrowly, you're losing a lot of kids. Kids with learning disabilities, dyslexia are eligible. My son is eligible. Just simply had to advocate. All right, there are steps. Now, Bookshare is not it, but access to that digital text is increasingly becoming available. It's how are we going to use it. All right, so, so it's out there. We just want to reinforce it and just kind of let's go from there. So there, oops, and you know what? If I do not turn this off, the wonderful thing about Natural Reader is it starts to read on its own. So it's very independent, so, so we're just going to hopefully close it and uh, hopefully not have that problem. If we do, we'll correct it. Oh, by the way, folks, you Mac users, you know you've been using speech to text, uh, text to speech for years and that you just highlight any text you have and it talks for you. Right? Mac user there? Mac user right here, what are you using? Do you know? No, you don't. It's there. It's been free. It's been about a decade and a half. My favorite voice is Alex. He's very nice. You PC users, you're not there yet. But Natural Reader, go give it to you for free, okay? Oh, and by the way, that text help, that little black thing that your um, uh, um, jump drive, the beauty of that is those are out there now where I can now simply take a jump drive, put it around my neck or whatever, and go to any computer in the lab, at home, in the library, at the community center, and I can get the text-to-speech right there. It's on the um, jump drive. So that's simple. So if I'm using something more powerful and I want to use it, there it is. All right. But we also know in terms of reading, there's a host of things out there. In terms of now on the iPad, and I'll mention that in just a second. I know many of you are using the iPad and the iPod Touch. But the cat in the hat, my goodness, there's an interactive cat in the hat, which is just an example, that will basically read, highlight the text off of the, um, the iPad, iPad Touch, and offer a variety of other features, which I'll reinforce in just a moment. There's sites like Literactive. There's, uh, I won't go, and these are things I'll spend more time in the extended version on, but folks, uh, Flat Stanley's a third grade reading for our school district, and so what we've done is we simply took uh, a PowerPoint version of Flat Stanley, our speech and language pathology, just did it for us. So now it's Flat Stanley's in a modified version, but it has all the access a PowerPoint does. So instead of reading the book, Nolan and others read PowerPoint. And so all the other options that PowerPoint offers you, audio, embedded video, the visuals, etc., are all there. And also it's modified. It's not the full version, but the main idea is there. So simple things like that. These are things out there. The question is, are they integrated in IEPs? I'd argue no. I'm not seeing that from a variety of things we're doing, which I'll reinforce in just a second. Of course, there's other resources out there that I'll jump through. Another resource to me is Book Builder. Now, what am I doing here? Well, I'm trying to reinforce the fact that there's a bunch of things out there. And then I want to say some of our challenges with that. Book Builder. Anyone familiar with Book Builder? Anyone? No? A few of us? Book Builder, folks, and I'm not sure why it's not taking me to what I already, there you go. Book Builder, folks, is free. It's off of uh, CAST, and CAST is a home of universal design for learning. If you're unfamiliar with that, I'm going to reinforce that here in just a moment. But what CAST has done is said, CAST has said, hey, we need text embedded in, with a variety of different support features to allow our learners to get beyond the print impairment. So let's go ahead and allow users to create their own books. Now this is not the best thing since sliced bread, but it has components that really get us thinking about what's possible. And it's free and it's old, and that it's been out there for a couple years. But let me go ahead and share with you a model book. Now I can... HTTP colon slash slash www.nten.org slash N-T-E-N-C-H-A-N-G. Okay, we're gonna quit you. There you go. As I said, I told you, I told you, so. All right, so now here's a model book. Now, for, now, this was created by I don't know who, but let's go ahead and get into it. Let's go to Gus's rain, Rainforest. 
And of course, I should have opened it out. The internet, have you guys noticed the internet is just so darn slow? Yeah, don't you go out on the internet right now. You're competing against me. Um, so here's Gus's Rainforest. Now what Gus's Rainforest has done is it allowed a, a group of teachers to up upload any pictures, upload any audio that they've recorded, type in any text, and then there's a variety of features they've embedded in it. And let me show you what I'm talking about. So first of all, here's Gus's Rainforest. And oh, by the way, this text help tool right here, right here, this is automatically, whoops, automatically embedded the highlighting the text to speech. It's automatically in there. So not only will you hear it, but if you wanted to just simply highlight and have the words read to you with highlights of each word, that's embedded. It's part of the application. It's part of the website. So with that said, let me just share with you the fact that I'm not sure whose voice this is, but we'll just have a... This is Rainforest Adventure. Written by Janice Marino. So this site allows you to record your own voice. Why is that important? Well, as you know, a number of learners out there want to be able to hear someone familiar to contextualize and the like. So if I want to hear Mrs. Buchanan's voice, there it is. Now more importantly, let's go ahead and let's move on to a couple pages here. So we'll go on to page, uh, this is a 17 page book, pretty small, but folks, there's sites out, uh, within this, people have created 10th grade materials to, to learn about how to be a historian and the like, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to wait for the site here to, to load, so let's just go to Monty. What I want to, oh, there we go. What I wanted to share with you is these guys down here. You see them down here? Pedro, Hallie, Monty. Let's go to Monty real quick. Now, Monty speaks fast. We'll get over that. Let me just share with you, as he's loading, what Monty's done is Monty, first of all, is a character. It's an agent that the site provides. You type in the text, and then what will happen is that I'm reading along with a book, I can click on Monty, and if I'm on a decent connection, which clearly we're not on today, Monty will pop up, and Monty will tell me, Monty's purpose is always to talk about the picture. So what has happened here is this isn't just simply text-to-speech, and this just simply isn't... It looks like a lizard that is green, small, and lives in trees or on plants. It's sunny in the picture. I think the gecko lives, lives in sunny places. So what this has done, and this is free, and there's a lot of sites out there now increasingly doing this, and that is, I'll give you the text to speech, I'll give you the pictures, you can audit, uh, add in your audio, but more importantly, you can target these agents, so Monty's purpose on every single page is to talk about the picture. And we know there's a lot about basic reading is, if you use the picture with the reading, it will help you with the words you're trying to read. Now Halley's purpose, let's say, is the main idea. So Halley could, so and Pedro, Pedro has another, maybe he's vocabulary. But then what we do is we teach the learner how to utilize those individuals, and those individuals are consistently used the same way. And now we have a book with embedded features, which is very, very powerful, using a lot of the things we do with direct instruction, but now allow the technology. I mention this because it's old. It's not the best thing since I spread, but it has a lot of the components that increasingly more and more book publishers are providing and where the technology is already allowing us for. So for example, let me just, I'll mention it, even though the slide's not up. You know on the iPad I had the text-to-speech on the iBook, okay? You know on the iPad I can increase my font size, decrease my font size, have it read to me, double-click on any word I don't know, and it'll take me to Wikipedia, which isn't too helpful to the users, work, the learners I work with. Uh, Wikipedia's too, you know, it's, it, but the capacity of being able to click and go somewhere, but also the fact that I can embed video, I can embed audio and things of that nature, so we're already there. It's just now how do we get that and utilize that with the youngsters we're working with. All right, and that's what I want to really focus on here. And I'm going to try to get focused on. But FYI, these are some things that are out there. I think pretty powerful. Can and let's kind of, yes, go ahead. Can the students use it? Can the students use this? Uh -huh. Oh, sure. I mean, book, it's free. You can create whatever you want. And you can get a free account. And you can create, it's, it's as simple as using PowerPoint in terms of they give you templates and you type in information. They say click, click here to add text. You click here to add text. Now students actually, I've worked with students who have actually created products about things they've done and they've used Book Builder to do it. Now there's other products out there that probably do a better version of what they did, but they wanted to share something, they wanted audio, they wanted some agents to support it and the like. But teachers have used this, like I said, across the grade span to share information as well. So, and this is one example of many out there. So that's Book Builder to get you thinking in terms of the reading. And as I mentioned in terms of the iBook,
And of course, I, I mentioned iPad, but it's available on Androids and others. But we already have these accessibility features. But please remember, and I can't emphasize this enough, and I don't know how you guys look upon the iPad, but the accessibility features are there and they're wonderful, but it goes so much beyond the accessibility in terms of the universality of the iPad, in terms of the iPad being the fact that you can embed video. That's not an accessibility feature. I don't go under accessibility under the iPad settings to find that. That's in there as norm. But the embedded video is critical to contextualize the reading I'm trying to learn because I can see the video about the llamas and better understand what a llama is when I'm reading about llamas that I've never seen before. Okay? A still picture won't do it. But what this is now allowing me to do will, as well as the accessibility features with reading text and the like. Okay, now, there's also the audio, right? Old school, we've been there, done that, downloaded books. Now, how many of us are creating our own audio, though? How many of us are creating our own audio books, MP3s, iTunes things, and things of that nature, podcasts? Any of us? No, a few of us, okay. Now, folks, this is simple and cheap and easy. Your PC and Macs allow you to do it. Audacity is one. Now, let me share with you, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the extended version, but, folks, here's Nolan talking to me about Little House on the Prairie. Okay, Nolan, so here we are. I'm gonna ask you a few questions about the chapter that we read together called The Fire on the Hearth, okay? And so I want you to talk really loud into the computer. So can you practice that for me? Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about The Fire on the Hearth? What happened in that chapter? Um, they built a special the chimney, they, they built the, the chimney outside. He <laughs> got rocks from the creek. Okay, so let's find out who's they. First of all, so who, who got rocks from the creek? Pa. Pa, pa got rocks from the creek? Yes, Pa got rocks from the creek and he got, and he made mud. And he plastered the, the, the mud off. <laughs> all right, so Nolan basically, um, is trying to share about a chapter he read in Little House on the Prairie. Now, Nolan can't do that in terms of typing because his typing skills are quite poor. Handwriting, handwriting is quite poor. But he, as you could understand, well, I hope you could understand, Nolan understood what was in chapter, I think it was chapter four, um, building of chapter five, building the, fire, uh, the fireplace. Now, the teacher, God love her, she brought home, she sent home a tape recorder. I didn't know they existed still. And I didn't recall them being, I didn't recall them being so heavy. Uh, and then go to Walmart and try to find a new blank tape. Those are, you know. Um, and so what Nolan was doing was he was recording what he knew into the tape recorder. And the challenge is the tape recorder was, the tape itself was, so oh, I don't know how many years old, because it was being recorded and recorded, so it was quite garbly. And then, of course, he had to bring the tape recorder back and forth, back and forth. No, let's use something. He just simply, we sat down. Uh, in the office, in my office, and we sat down and we talked about it. And then we simply sent off the MP3, which I opened up in iTunes, she could open up in anything on her Windows Media Player, and the teacher can listen to it and get a reinforcement that with a class of 26 students that Nolan's in, that there is actually learning going on, he is understanding it, and let's reinforce this meaningful integration of Nolan into that classroom. All right, now Audacity course can be used for us to share what we know. We can create audio books. We can read books in there and save them. We can create narrated books. I'll talk about that later, the, the next session. But Audacity is out there too. It's free, both Mac and PC. Mac users may use GarageBand. It's a little bit more intense. Photo Story, I won't talk, I won't spend time on it, but Photo Story, folks, is free on the PC. It allows me to create interactive uh, window media versions that aren't movies, but they play like movies. So there's a lot of things out there uh, that are free, and again, I'll talk about that later on. All right, I imagine many of us are using video, right? Okay, how many of us are using flip cameras? Yes, flip cameras are wonderful, are they not? Isn't it sad that Cisco bought them and now you know, go out and buy them because they're not being made, they're not gonna be made anymore. Okay, at least the last thing that they came out about a month ago, if you haven't heard that. Now the flip camera, the wonderful thing is the flip part, right? That's what people love, but I'd argue that's not the best part. The best part is this, right? The best part is the fact that not only the screen, but the button. So, well, two years ago, those have heard me in the past, I apologize for repeating this story, but to me it's just incredible. Uh, Christmas 2009, Nolan wanted a video camera, okay? Take a look at children's video cameras, they stink. 
Uh, well, actually, two, two years ago they did. So, of course, these were, now this is an HD one. The non-HD ones were being sold and they were cheap discounts. So I come home with one and I show it to my wife and my wife's like, you gotta be crazy. You're gonna give that to Nolan? And, uh, well, sure enough, these are hard to break. And sure enough, it's basically a button to turn it on, right? And then a button to record. It's that simple. And then you're, 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 you're going. So I'll talk more about these in the extended version, but the beauty of it is I can get video in lots of different ways. I can get video off my new iPad, which that's not a new one, uh, but that's coming, but I can clearly get video off my iPod Touch. So lots, and I'll also take pictures. So lots of different ways of accessing and getting video, and you know video is very powerful. There's some good research. There's about 25 years of research for kids with intellectual disabilities and those on the spectrum where video, video modeling, and the like can be very powerful interventions. Great, excellent, and the technology has made it easier. We can download it and edit it. Great, preaching to the choir, you know that. Well, I'll come back to that here in just a second. All right, writing programs. My goodness, are there good writing programs out there. I'm not sure of you, how many of us are using Clicker 5 or things like that, but the idea that, folks, I can use symbols as well as words to be able to communicate what I know. Why is that important? Well, if I have a handwriting issue and that's getting in the way of my writing, and how many of you have seen this? Where the assignment is a writing assignment, but the, the, the individual we're working on, it's turning into a handwriting assignment. Not a writing assignment, it's a handwriting assignment. And then we talk to the team members to try to explain to them it's a handwriting assignment, not a writing assignment. And what I'm amazed, we're, we're, well, okay, what's the problem? Ah, okay, you know, they, they know what they know, let them demonstrate that. Well, we're, we have this, you know, we, first they have to do this, and they have to do this, and they, well, yeah, okay, but where's the language then being developed in respect to that? All right, but Clicker 5 is a program out there, as you know, as many of you probably know. I can use pictures, I can use sentences, I can use words, and then I can click, so it's, a, it's literally a switch type of application, but I can also use the keyboard to add to things like that. This is old, it's been out there for several years, but in the writing process, we're adding to that, and I'll talk more about this in the extended version, but science writers, free online, it allows me to have embedded support to write science writing programs. The other image you have there is an extended version of, okay, if I'm beyond the visuals, but I want to have a word prediction, uh, audio output, uh, word library, and the like, and have it all online, I can do that as well. So there's several writing applications out there beyond co-writer, write out loud, etc. They're out there, they're very good. Now increasingly, Speech to text. Of course, in my travels, I forgot to bring it. But my microphone, I'm not sure how many of you are using it. I can go down to Walmart and buy it now, Dragon Naturally Speaking. The target's not for our kiddos. But the beauty of it is it's becoming so mature that no one can't use it, not with his speech. But a lot of our students can, you know, that teacher that says if they could just do, if they could just share what they, you know, they tell me what they, they, they could just write what they say, right? Well, sure, okay, well here, I can hook me up and let me start talking. And the beauty of this is multiple users. I can use one computer and have them all signed in individually differently, have that mic and go to town on that. That's both Mac and PC. The PC is actually better than the Mac on this one. There's other programs in terms of comic strips. This is one of my favorites. What are we doing in terms of time? Uh, you know what, let me share it to you. This is one of my favorites because it allows you to take what a lot of students like, and that's comics, but go beyond that. So let me ex explain to you, this is comic life, and there's a lot of different things online about comics that I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, in the extended version. But I'm not sure how many of you use, uh, well, let me ask you this, how many of you use comics or have seen comics being used to be able to do share knowledge, uh, share information, individuals express themselves? No? If you have young men on the spectrum, oh my gosh, all right? Uh, but also, I mean, it's not gender based. Comics are something kids connect with. Now, the comics may be interactive and, and the like. A lot of different places out there online that do that. What I like about this site is that this basically allows me to take my picture. So let me go ahead and I can simply take any type of uh, template. Don't ask me why they have sounds like this, but they do. And they're, so here's Nolan with his buddy. And this is simply taking, it goes automatically into your library of your pictures and, or any graphic images you have, anything you have, it'll take and then you can simply grab them. So let's go ahead and grab a few more. 
All right, and I'm not sure if you're noticing it, but I'm, something that I just find wonderful with this is I'm taking a big picture. Look at the big picture, I let go, and it automatically sizes it. Oh, and if I want to move it, <coughs> don't ask me why it offers that sound, but it does. So if you're ever using this in a lab, make sure it goes to mute because the kids find this out immediately and are like, oh. All right, so I can get rid of pictures here. I can add in my own lettering. So mommy and the kids, okay. But then I can take this, so it moves that there. But these things, and so just the development of it is fairly interactive and fairly appreciated by the, and this is only 25 bucks, $25 this program, okay. Now let's go ahead and do some lettering here. Now why they have this, I don't know, but let's say uh, we'll put our title, oops, title here. Uh, I can't type. Okay, don't know why. I don't know why, but I tell you, they, they're, they're, so here we go, now let's stretch it. Stretch it again. Okay, now I'm done here, so I'm gonna simply dr drag this down. Okay, I'm going to drag, pull another one in there. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but actually, page one, page two. So now I can create my comic strip. Page one, page two, it can save it as a PDF. I don't even need Comic Life to have it after this. And now I have a comic book. Or I can import it into other features. I can create that slide and put, uh, create it and put it into PowerPoint. I can put it into Word uh, in terms of how I use it. So the beauty of it is I have all these photos to go. And again, uh, now I can go out and find things. So for example, I can go out to my finder and I can simply find images out there. Okay. Well, here's it. Huh. Not sure what that comic is. Okay. And then also, if you have a camera on your machine, you can capture. So here we go. So we'll go, uh, we'll freeze it, and then there we go. Okay, so that's if you have a camera. Now we'll get rid of my face there. But that's Comic Life. Now this is a couple years old, and there's a lot of comic strips out there. Very powerful tool in my opinion because of what we know about social skill development in comics, what we know in terms of my ability to demonstrate my knowledge. If I can do it through a storyboard, comic strips are a storyboard, the beauty of it, I could do it in PowerPoint. Yeah, but something like interactive like this, much more powerful. And you may say, I don't have comic life. Fine. There's websites out there that allow me to do comic strips. The idea is this is out there in a pretty powerful uh, application, not the comic life, but the whole idea of comics. All right. So, voice thread I'll mention this afternoon. So what's the problem? All right, and many of you are saying, Sean, like these. Yeah, we're doing some of these things. Sean, you missed uh, a good dozen more. I'm with you, okay? And we'll talk about some of those uh, the, in the extended version. But what's the problem? Well, I'll argue the problem, and I'll argue the problem is evident if you look at the literature. And so my home is looking at research, and why? Because there's a lot to be learned from re research, and we're living in a tier-based uh, environment that says we need to start things that are evidence-based. I'm all for evidence-based. I don't want you wasting no one's time. I want to make sure it's effective and also it's efficient. It may be effective, but if it takes three months to do and you can do it in a month, let's do it in the month, all right? So, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but to me, the problem in terms of the uh, aspect of the AT, and there's Nolan hamming it up for uh, Special Olympics, but is that I find too often, folks, that AT's not getting on the IEP. Yep. So we with yeah, yep. hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay, hallelujah. so there you go. Uh, well, you know, and we're doing it just to reinforce it. We're doing a study right now across the state. We're targeting some states, uh, some districts, and some co-ops. I've been out to three now. We'll we'll have probably about nine where we're sampling out. Um, literally, probably over. I think we'll sample out for each area, well over 100 IEPs. And we're looking at these IEPs in terms of, as you know, the IEP. The IEP, folks, has, some folks say, a lot of requirements. I'd argue it doesn't have a lot of requirements. There's some basic things that need to be there. And one of the things that legislatively has been there since 1997, in terms of been there since 1990, but 1997 is required is the AT consideration. I need to consider, and I need to say I considered it. And yet here we are, 14 years later, 
and it's still not happening. And yes, what some, some of you are, yeah, we check it, okay? And now there's, there's reasons for that, and, and I'm not trying to say, gosh, the teachers are horrible and all that. No, they're not. But rather what's happening is that these technologies that I mentioned, let alone all the other technologies out there, are not showing up on the IEPs. Now some of you may be saying, well, Sean, if they're used in the classroom, I'm happy with that. Well, come and speak to me about that. I'll let you, I'll get you, give, give you an earful as a parent because a parent of me says, wait a minute here, as many of you are parents probably. When I sit down with my son and daughter's team, separate from the IEP, I get them three times a year. We do trimester updates. I get them for 20 minutes, unless I schedule something different. And that's fairly normal in the Kansas City metro area. Maybe four times a year, but those parent conferences. And what do we talk about, folks? What, when they sit down with us and they give me an update, separate from the IEP meeting, what are they, what are they legally bound to talk to me about? Progress, Progress related to what? To my IEP, therefore they're going to pull out my IEP or they're going to modify it and they're going to share with me what I'm doing. And if AT is not on that IEP, are we talking about technology? Nope. Nope. No. No, of course we're not. Okay? Unless, and, and, and I hear too often with parents, and of course, you know, I feel I'm, I'm, the, the, uh, I'm not the norm. You know, because I want to talk, I, I, meet, I try to meet with my team, uh, at least my special education teacher, my general education teacher, and my related service, the speech person, at least every three weeks. They don't like me for that. Uh, <laughs> I bring food. I'll bring lunch. I'll bring breakfast. But it's gotten to a point where, you know, I feel I've, in all honesty, I feel I've bent over backwards to a fair amount in this last 24 months. And Leslie can share a little bit what, because she's been included in every single email I send lately. Because sadly, I'm going, Leslie's out of Topeka with families together. That also knew her. Um, but I'm, I, I, because it's getting into the point where folks were not doing it. Now let's get into, sadly, this requirement, this advocacy, which is it's not a bad thing. It's just not the area I want to go to. Now, folks, let's take a look at Nolan. I'll, I'll, we're going to spend more time with him this, uh, later on. But the, the folks, Nolan has a variety of challenges. So what are my technology solutions? You could probably just start right off the bat. I won't ask you to do that now. But right off the bat, I met you both individuals. Uh, any individual you look at, there's technology possibilities. But what I see in terms of uh, AT and the IEP is, first of all, underutilization of the technology we select. I see a disconnect between a true identification process. I see a disconnect in terms of collecting data for the assessment process. I see a disconnect in terms of then the solution we find and then the use, and that turns into underutilization or abandonment. There's a lot of literature out there on augmentative communication devices that are abandoned. Why? Gosh, there's a meta-analysis of about 14 different studies that examined it from the family perspective and the fact that the family wasn't engaged in the, the selection of the augmented communication device, and so the family is one of the reasons they're abandoning it because they weren't engaged in it and therefore they're not going to reinforce their child using it because of some primary issues. And, and, and you read it and you're like, that makes perfect sense. The family wasn't part of it, okay? But also I'd argue some of the other processes had some limitations, all right? So with that, there are, FYI, and I know many of you know this, but you know what? Parents don't. And this is where I'll spend more time later on. I apologize. I'm just trying to give you some, some nuggets here. But folks, we have some good considerations forms out there. If I say the WADI, does that make sense? The WADI, Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative. That's out the second one. They, they've created what's called the ASNET, 64-page document that allows users to take information you have and better understand what technologies would connect. If I have a reading challenge and comprehension, what are some potential technology solutions? The WADI helps me. Georgia has created some instruments off of their GPAT site. Texas has a wonderful series of modules that walk professionals, as well as it could be parents, through the AT consideration process. Wonderful. It's very basic PowerPoint types of things, but very thorough. What I find is parents don't know anything about it, folks. They don't know the documents exist. They don't know the consideration frameworks exist. You know, this is something that if I, had, if I had your position, some of the things I would do is empower parents on the fact that when you sit down in the IP meeting and you have all this information about your son or daughter, here's some other things that are out there to connect the dots between what your son or daughter strengths and skills they have and then what potentially could lead to technology. Because often what we find, and many of you know this, is first of all the parent may ask for the Cadillac. And then it's a conversation about the Cadillac and the fact that a bicycle might do. And that gets us nowhere. 
In other instances, we just don't talk about it because we don't even know where to begin. Or what we do is, yes, technology would be helpful, so what we'll do is we'll find a technology application that's available in the building and we'll use that. Leads to abandonment because you haven't selected the technology based on the child's needs that are there in the IEP. There are forms out there that help us. So empowering parents in respect to that I think would be critical. It is critical, okay? Because professionals have that, sadly the parents don't. One of them is a simple thing called the SET framework. Anyone familiar with that? Good, okay, a few of us. The SET framework, folks, is all about the student environment task and tools. And what they simply do is they take what we already have in front of us on the IEP and start matching up the fact that, well, let me give you an example with Nolan. Nolan has difficulties with writing. So he cannot demonstrate his knowledge. And he has problems with handwriting. So the use of a keyboard has some limitations. So basically right now he uses a scribe. So we've gotten down to the fact that, wait a minute here, Mr. Harris, the scribe, the parrot, won't come home with Nolan. I don't know why, but he won't, okay? So therefore, Nolan doesn't do any writing at home. And when Mr. Harris is not there, Nolan doesn't do it, or he goes out into the pod, or he goes out to the special education classroom, so now he's left the building, left the room. So therefore, okay, so we look at the student, we look at the environment he's trying to work with in the general education classroom, we look at the task he's trying to do, and our tool right now is a person. Mm -mm -mm. Now, now we're at a point where let's have a conversation. But what I find is we don't even get to that point. Okay, we're up here at the student and we're not even considering the environment and we're not even considering the task. The set framework gets us to a point where, hey now, let's realize we need to find some tools and now let's use the ASNET, let's use the GPAT and others to try to identify some of those tools. So those things are out there, but sadly I don't think we're integrating it well with parents at all. All right. Now, I don't know about you, but I love nursery rhymes, so Mary Mary, quite contrary. How does your student grow with follow-up and training and data collected on each goal, right? Okay. There we go. But the beauty of it is, you know, that's, that's, we're there, but we're not doing it in AT. Now, let me list you some of the reasons I see why. Well, because some of them are what I call the Marthas of the world. And Martha. Martha is the AT coordinator for a 10,000-person school district. And she has about 1,500 students on IEPs. All right? That's, that's about average. Think about it, about 15%, right? So now of that, um, 15, so, so of that, uh, that group, um, she, um, she is the AT coordinator. Now she has a team of five other individuals, related service providers, OTs and PTs. Why related service people? Because they're flexible in their ability to meet and they also are good in terms of the traditional AT in respect to mobility, and access, fine motor, gross motor, et cetera, makes a lot of sense. And speech and language for that. Okay, so I sit down as this group, and by the way, the IP team is supposed to basically meet, and then they're supposed to say, oh, this child needs more information about AT, so we call Martha. And Martha and her team then interact they, we fill out a form as an IP team, and it comes to Martha. Martha and her team considers it. They may come out and do some observation. They come out and data collect, and then they help us decide an appropriate AT solution. Does that sound familiar? I'll tell you in the Kansas City area, very familiar. I'll tell you in Ohio, extremely familiar. I'll tell you in Florida, yes, they're doing a lot of that. I'll tell you in Missouri, yes. I mean, I get around. I don't go so much West Coast. I go more East Coast. New York, very much so. So what is the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is the fact that Martha and her team just do the math with the 1,500 kids on IEPs. How many can they handle? I'd argue less than 200 if they're going to do it well. It's, they're part-time too, even if they wore the primary AT hat. To go out and do all that with 172 contract days with the kiddos, that's not going to happen. So that to me is somewhat broken. Now the challenge is, and I was just with a group in the Kansas City metro area representing 10 different districts and I was preaching to them and they're pushing back like no tomorrow with the fact that no, the system works. We do a very good job and I, and I appreciate that but only to a slight group of people. You're, you're missing Nolan. You are. Because kids with intellectual disabilities, I'm sorry, go out and try to find a technology company that's created for kids with Down syndrome or intellectual disabilities. The market will never be there. It's not sustainable. So where do we go? And where do, we, where do we help our folks? Well, to me, where we go with this is in the area of universal design for learning. Now, I know many of you are probably familiar with this. If you're not, it's something I believe you should be familiar with.
It's part of IDA 2004. It's going to be part of the NCLB or ESEA reauthorization. It was already part of the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. UDL folks has three primary principles, right? So basically, multiple means of representation, action expression, and engagement. So the idea here, for those who are familiar with it, as you know, let's go with text. Instead of simply saying, here's a book, read it, oh, and then we'll modify and accommodate after that, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a book, but the book has digital components to it, the book is embedded with features, the book has text-to-speech with it, and the like. So now, it's not that I'm print impaired and I can't access the print, and as we know, fourth grade up, 80% or more of what we base our learning on, or teaching on, is reading. So if they can't get access to that book, they're behind the eight ball. So let's do it multiple means of representation. So right from the get-go, instead of adding on all these other features, let's find textbooks, grab down from Bookshare and the like, and embed those tier one automatically. We're finding districts do that, okay? That will take us a long way in respect to that. Now, UDL has some great resources. This is a wonderful one. I'm making reference to it. It's on, your, it's on the PowerPoint when you download it. I'm not going there. Come back at 9.15, we'll spend some time on it. But what they've done here on this wiki is they've contextualized, okay, let me show you what UDL looks like in action. I'll give you some technology resources, and we'll talk about those later. But what I'm trying to say is universal design for learning, if we're looking at the idea of the fact that when we start with the fact that we want an individual to demonstrate what they know, and we're going to look at a variety of different ways to allow them to demonstrate what they know, and not just simply say, it starts here, folks. No, we need to say, instead of demonstrating what you know, we're going to give you a variety of different components here. And we're not just going to do it for kids with disabilities. I mean, come on, this is a YouTube generation. Creating videos, everyone's creating videos. So USA Today just talked about YouTube 2.0. People are making money off of this, for goodness sake. And in terms of people making careers on being on YouTube. Where I'm going with this is video is critical. Video is being used for lots of different people, not kids with disabilities. Video is being used more so with the typically developing student than a kid with a disability, with a child with a disability. But then let's allow video to be used to storyboard, organize, and demonstrate what I know. Let's use that flip cam. Let's use that, uh, the iPod. Let's use the uh, iPad in terms of collecting the video and allow me to demonstrate it. So, folks, there are a variety of different resources out there to learn about UDL. These are linkable, so when you get up to the PowerPoint and open it up, go ahead and click here. You'll go to some places that teach people how to use UDL. I think that's critical. I think parents need to know about universal design for learning. Yes? So this is a good question about pulling this into the IEP and empowering the parent to be the advocate for this. And to me, this is, this is an onion, multiple layers, okay? And I think CAST is a good start. You know, I work with CAST, we're writing a grant with CAST. At times, I'm not sure if CAST is the right group to bring in for parents or for parent trainers in terms of universal design for learning. We can talk about that individually. There's some other folks doing, I think, comparable work that... Um, uh, CAST is a very big picture, so... Uh, but, but, but with that said, Folks, where I'm going with this is, first of all, I believe what I've been talking about with the AT and the technology, there's part of it, and I, and I want to finish up that with the UDL in just a moment, but I believe in terms of the advocacy and the IP, developing collaborators, using the map, and things of that nature is totally separate from technology. I believe there's a lot of work you guys are engaged in and you're continuing engaged in to empower the parent and the IEP process. I believe that's critical. I believe that continues. It could be parallel with the technology. It could include the technology, but it, it's, it's separate from the technology as well. 
and that to be empowering parents to be the advocates at an IP meeting, to have them realize what collaboration is like, to have them realize, and some of you are probably there because gosh knows I'm there, and you know, I don't know about the rest of you folks, but many of you only know are parents of children with disabilities, and you, you, you gotta figure, there's gotta be an ego involved. I know there's an ego with me, because I'm figuring, I'm sitting down here at the IP meeting, and the team sits on the other side, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, if you're doing it with me, what the heck are you doing with the folks that you know, aren't nearly as knowledgeable? So literally, I'll, I'll start the meeting saying, could we move around a little bit? Yes. You know, I'm a pain to them. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's just like, but fortunately, as a faculty member, it's like, uh, this is a teachable moment. Let's do a little professional development here. But to me, those things are critical. Those things are critical to me, separate from the technology. Now, let's start talking about the technology. To me, if I was engaged with parents, it's first of all, understanding that some of these tools are out there that we should engage our teams in to say, hey, and, and, and focus. Let's focus on the reading. And folks, we have all this good information about Tommy and reading, but I understand there's this set framework. And how can we use this to better understand some of the technologies? Now, the, that to me is one strategy. On, in addition to that strategy would be trying to narrow down these technologies. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming for the team. It's overwhelming for the parents. If we use the UDL lens, to me, and that UDL Tech Toolkit's a good example of that, that's a start. So now we're, we're, we're narrowing down, we're not looking at every technology, we're looking at technologies that offer a variety of different things in terms of the principles, representation, demonstration, access. You know, things like this, you know, there's a lot of video cameras out there. Why the flip camera? Well, because darn it all, it's two buttons to get it started and I can quickly download it. This is so less, I mean, I'll give Nolan my camera and to have him take pictures, and it's, it's no, no, he, he doesn't do it nearly as well as he does this. So th this is the type of, if I think of universal, if I think of access, right, and I start principal, I'll, I'll immediately come to something like this versus maybe even something like this, because what does this require that this doesn't require? What does the iPod Touch require? Fine motor. Yes, fine motor. People talk about the iPod Touch, oh, it's wonderful, but it's still fine motor. I have problems with this, okay, let alone the individual with a disability. All right, so I know I'm not answering it, all right, so, but, 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 but to me the universal design is, is critical. Now, I want to piggyback on UDL because you're saying, well, okay, Sean, but what about engaging those general education teachers because we want them integrated there. Well, folks, this is very much in line with the 21st century framework, which states like Ohio and others are incorporating into what they're doing. So it's very much in line there, or 21st century skills, in terms of the universal design aspect, are, are, they're very comparable, okay? So to me, in terms of an entry point. All right, so a couple of more thoughts, and then uh, I'll move on. All right, so let's talk about this. So, Sean, what does this actually mean then for the IP team? Well, to me, to begin with, and I'll repeat myself just a bit, I think we need to empower our parents to understand the fact that there are tools out there available to us that allow us to narrow down an understanding of what technology tools relate to what we know about our son or daughter. And you know the experts about a child with a disability is the parent in many instances. They'll list you what they can do and what they can't do. And I know this is kind of counterintuitive. But, you know, I remember Martha Blue Banning. Is anyone familiar with Martha Blue Banning's work out of the Beach Center? She's done a lot of interesting work on families. And Martha was one, when Nolan was young, when we were working with the community services and the waiver type of things and the like, you know, Sean, you don't tell them what he can do, you tell them what he can't do. Okay, don't go in there talking positive about your son. Go in there telling them what he can't do because that's going to make him eligible for some of these things. And I know we can have a discussion on that and philosophically some people may say I'm uncomfortable with that. But what I'd at least have you considering on the technology part is at least if we can narrow down saying my son or daughter can't do the following. They can't read traditional text. They can't read the strategies they're using to chunk the material is not giving them any closer to fluency and comprehension. So check, 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 those things aren't working. It's narrowing down to the fact that you can't do the following, so there's gotta be another solution out there. Let's start looking technology. It may not be the only solution, but it might be a, a kind of uh, interconnected. Secondly, if we look with the universal design for learning, if we look at tools that are already in the classroom, that have a variety of features that our son or daughter could benefit from, I think that's going to help us with less abandonment. I think that will help us with better integration. 
in respect to the fact that the general education teacher is already using it. I think it's going to get us away from having to look to the Marthas of the world and go through that process. Now the one question that you may be asking that I continue to ask is, where does it show on the IEP? Does it fall under the traditional AT? Does it fall under the supplemental service? Does it fall under the old, the, the old PLEP or the PLAF or whatever you want to call it? Uh, but to me, it's got to be in the IEP somewhere. But it may not fall under the Martha's version of the IEP in terms of AT consideration. It may fall somewhere else, but it's got to be there. All right? And we have a limited time today. So, so I know I have um, maybe more questions than answers. But I hope I at least have you thinking a little bit about, okay, these technologies are wonderful, but some of the challenges. Connie. Right. The other thing is that a lot of times, if that is universal design, then the teacher says, oh, we do that for all kids. We don't need to put it on there. Now, that's the, Connie, thanks for bringing that up. Folks, the parent in me says, no. We use Kidspiration and Inspiration all the time. If you're unfamiliar with it, I'm going to talk about it here a little bit in a few minutes. Not today, I mean at the 915 session. But Inspiration, Kidspiration, folks, I go out to, to schools. The internet is out there. Firefox, Internet Explorer, Word, Microsoft, uh, PowerPoint, the Microsoft families are there. And the most likely pre-K through 5 program out there is, is Kidspiration, and 6 through 12 is kid, uh, Inspiration. Inspiration. Why? Because it's extremely useful for all students. But Connie, I'm with you. It's sitting on the machine. I'll give Nolan his example. Several years ago, it's like, why aren't we using Kidspiration with Nolan? And the second grade teacher goes, well, that, we don't have that. Well, yes, you do. It's up here. It's on. So I ended up doing a professional development for a host of teachers to share with them the fact that Kidspiration has been in your building for five years. You just didn't know it. But that's, that's important. But then how do you put it on the IEP? That's critical. I can tell you my own personal experience. I've given them 24 months on this. And it's, we have right now on the IEP a slant board and... Uh, something else, Leslie, I can't recall what it is. So literally, at the end, of, uh, the end of the school year, I sat down with them and wrote out goals and objectives and handed it to them, saying, this is what we need to have on there. <laughs> so I, I had to because of what you're talking about, Connie. I allowed them to kind of try to integrate it, and it wasn't happening. So it still needs to be somehow, as we bridge this process, it needs to be on that IEP. Now, last thing here, as I leave... Uh, with you, and if you want to come back at 9.15, we'll talk more about this. But, you know, many of us are thinking iPod, iPad, etc., and how wonderful it is. And it is. But it, to me, can be back to the overwhelmingness, and then how do you tech, t tie it to an IP and the like. Let me give you one example as you leave here to be thinking about. All right? And I'm going to move through lots of different things. But, folks, I don't know about you, but Foursquare is a popular app. Anyone familiar with it? Foursquare, I want to go down to Denver. Hey, there's a bunch of us. You're up in the hotel room. You're in the shower. Uh, you're out here. Hey, this is where we're going to go. This is where we're meeting. And basically, via Foursquare, you find out where it is, and we can go and join you. I don't have to call everybody. You know, we all just join there, okay? And we get together, and it's very popular amongst maybe some of your teenage children. Uh, and they're probably telling them where to go, which is probably, um, or young adults, it's probably a bar. I mean, that's the Foursquare initially was very popular for that. It continues to be. But Foursquare is not a universally designed application. It's powerful, but it's not too helpful. And you may be saying, well, I don't want my child telling everyone where they are at a bar. Um, <laughs> the, the idea is Foursquare also is a person locator. A person locator? Now, would that be helpful yes. with some of our youngsters and some of our adults? Sure, but the problem is Foursquare is not too universally designed. But the idea works. So now, I like the idea of a person locator, but what's the app? Oh my gosh, there's a bunch of apps out there. But this is where the app is universal. This is out of Abelink Technologies, just south of us in Colorado Springs. They've done some wonderful work. Take a look at it. Primarily, take a look at this third screen. I'm okay, please contact me. I'm okay, please contact me. Now, this will work on an iPod, but the problem with the iPod is I have to be um, wireless. So this is really for my cell phone. So I have my iPhone. This is not my iPhone. I don't have an iPhone. My wife won't let me have one yet. So we're working on that. <laughs> so I have my iPhone. So I'm the young adult with a disability. And so I'm off We're at the library where I'm supposed to be. Now, in the middle screen there, you can see it can set up where every five minutes or more, I will get from my iPhone, it will automatically email out 
to mom or dad, the service provider, whatever, where I'm at. And then when I get that email, I open it up, and I could be on my iPhone, I can be on my computer, and it'll show me on Google Maps where I'm at. Okay? So now I'm at the library. And then five minutes from now, I'm out in the parking lot. Five minutes from now, they're two blocks away from the library. Five, you know, oh, now I can call them and say, what are you doing? Okay? <laughs> or the young man or daughter can simply say, wait a minute, where am I? And take out their iPhone, and it would be on there, and simply go, please contact me. And of course, instead of saying, where are you? Uh, a white house is in front of me with a dog and it's barking at me. No, I can look at Google Maps and know exactly where the individual is. These are the apps that to me are very powerful. And these are the apps in terms of your decision making that to me are very consistent with what we've talked about up to this point, especially with the universal aspect, to be able to narrow down. Otherwise, what we'll say is the iPod's great, but it's overwhelming. Where do we go? Well, we need to drill down, narrow down. And by the way, to me, the suggestions would be starting with companies that already do good work for kids with disabilities because they're moving into the app business and they already know what our kids need. So with that said, let me kind of bring you to, uh, there's several other things I want to mention, but those are for at 9.15. Uh, FYI, what I wanted to share with you was the um, <coughs> URL again in terms of the wiki. So if you want this PowerPoint, you want some Word documents, this is where you want to go. I apologize, I, I hyperlinked it. So it's simply my name. It's also on your Word document at the bottom. It's my name, seanjsmith.pbworks.com slash peak, P-E-A-K, which I, of course... There's also a link to it on, on the website, you guys. Really okay. Yeah, really okay. Five, uh, yeah, region, and I apologize. I probably should have put region five since it's not just a peak thing. Um, and, uh, but there's my email address. What you'll get is this full PowerPoint, and you'll also get a Word document with a lot of other links and a lot of other resources. Feel free, if you have questions, to email me. I'd love to get more of those discussions that were asked of me about you know, really working with those parents. And I truly believe, and I apologize for going over my time, but I truly believe, folks, you are critical for this next step with technology integration. Uh, if the parents aren't empowered, I, this model that's in place right now, I just, I, I don't know, I see challenges. So, if you have individual questions, let me know. Otherwise, I think I'm over my time. You need to get to your other session. So, all right. So, thank you.